dissolve right in front of my eyes. It's fucking exhilarating, <laughs> boys. Yeah, we're here for it. I love it. I feel alive. Let's go. Yeah, man. You know what? Hey, pullbacks it's are normal in a bull market, man. That's, that's just what it is. You want volatility. Up and down. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the way I think about this kind of stuff with, with DoorChain, it just changes the incentives. Like, before, uh, there was over 75% of fees going towards LPs, and nodes were getting, like, you know, 2 to 3% yields. Right now, you know, node APRs are, are going up, so if you're, if you're bonding, it's definitely not a bad time to be, uh, to be doing that, you know? Like, it just changes the incentives, and it just, it just aligns everything, uh, you know, makes sure that we have enough security for liquidity. So it's just the natural flow of things, the way I look at it. I also look at it like a month ago, two months ago, with 10 bucks or 7 bucks, I only would have got one rune. Now I'm almost getting two. So that's all that matters. <laughs> just accumulate. That's it. Everything, I mean, we're, we're looking at the charts of people using the tech. Volumes keep going up. I mean, I, I checked uh, Twitter, the timeline, and you know, saw people were kind of arguing back and forth with the direction of development and whatnot. And I think... I mean, it's it's val valid points, and the community is voicing, which is great. You know, I think it's it's awesome that the community is um, speaking their mind. It, it's just these are these are complex things to navigate. Like, what is the ultimate direction? And I'm sure you guys have some answers today, and that's why partly this this space is, is happening. I'm I'm very curious to hear the the pros and cons of of both directions, or if there's multiple directions, like what what those pros and cons are. Yeah, and um, yeah. So today, like, I think we could definitely talk about like what's going on in in Q one and what the short term priorities are. And yeah, there's been a lot of discussion about like what the long term is, just for you know DoorFi and like new feature development in general. And obviously, there's been a ton of discussion on that. But all that is kind of like in the future because there's still a lot of priorities that like that need to be done over the next you know three to three to five months, which are going to take a lot of time to get shipped out like more more pressing things than uh you know things like rune vault 2.0 and 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 things like that which are, are going to be obviously debated and you know whether they even come to fruition one day like there's no even solid design or consensus around it yet so it's like i personally think it's better to just focus on the things that are like for sure coming like around the corner and like you know everyone agrees that there's some kind of consensus on like hey we're going to do these um we're, we're going to like focus on these things right now. And then, then we move forward and decide like where we go from there. And obviously like safety, security and like protecting LPs and things like that need to. Well, like, can you explain to me real one. quick, the two different main routes. So there's like one, one route or one vision where from what I understand, it's purely cross chain liquidity and swapping basically stream swaps. And then the other, vision or or route that you could take would be thorify with lending and other kind of more like banking style products if you will so i'm i'm very curious to know like what what is your what is your stance on things when it comes to those two routes is there is there you know is it kind of like i haven't been a part of the thorchain community long enough to realize was there a, a, an original ethos, if you will, and now we've migrated from that ethos, or was this kind of all part of it? Um, and and I, I just I don't know enough, right? And so that's why I'm I'm tuning in here to learn. But that's just what I'm seeing. I'm almost seeing people torn on like these two paths, and it's causing a little bit of fud. So I'm I'm very curious to get your perspective. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me see if Chad is uh, your mic working now. Let's. Uh... Yeah, I, I I just got rid of the headphone. There we go. Sweet. So, all right. So I think we can, let's dive in first and say like what the, like the, the, the core of ThorChain, there's, um, yeah, obviously there's some debate around like, you know, where to go, but everyone knows that the, the core of ThorChain is around, you know, around nodes bonding Rune and then LPs that provide Rune and another asset for liquidity. And really the debate is around how to scale liquidity in uh, in proportion to, to make sure that, you know, obviously we're not overscaling liquidity to be unsecured or anything, but there's just the, the difference in vision on like, do we get to Valhalla from 
just dual liquidity, which has been the, the core of Dorshane from from day one? Or do we get there through this, uh, you know, through a combination of dual liquidity, which is always the core of Dorchain, but then building things on top of it, like uh, like savers, which um, which is obviously a great product, but um, you know pushes risk around to the dual LPs where they're more highly rune levered, and it changes their risk appetite. So, uh, and then there's things like lending, which are built on top, which are are completely separate. I think I think the, the the kind of the debate right now is more around just where to go in the liquidity sphere and mostly just making sure that things are safe because i think everyone can agree that like savers is a really awesome product but making sure that dual lps which is what the protocol is kind of built around uh like wh whether that is the is the core product or whether that can kind of be abstracted away and be in the background as part of this you know thorfi design or uh yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's just whether, is that is that the core? And, like, do we need to do everything again to protect dual LPs? Or is the future more, like, savers plus protections to make sure that uh, savers is always solid? Well, does that mean that, so w with people, it's like a lot of people fear change, right? So it's just the, is this just the natural progression of things? And people who have been in the community a long time that were kind of sold on this original vision, they're just not capable of, modifying their stance and realizing hey th this is just a better vision overall or are they right in the sense of hey we should stick to that original ethos and not deal with DeFi because there's other risks uh with building out DeFi, like other risk vectors you know if, if so that that's kind of where I, I like i just don't know enough and chad i'd be very curious to get your perspective on those risk factors and like just overall, what, what you think about that situation? Is this still maintaining kind of the original ethos just enhanced? Or is it like, yeah, we're, we're kind of switching it up with these Thorfi style features? Well, originally, uh, Thorfi was, was not part of the original design, right? So if you go back to the original white paper, right, you could either look at the one that was from 2018 or you could look at the one from, from 2019, 2020. But like the Thorfi concepts weren't designed or or considered at that time because at that time we we're just trying to like solve the problem of like cross-chain liquidity which in itself is obviously very complicated and difficult thing to solve and required a lot of time and research and coding time and whatever else to to get it to actually work right um it didn't make sense at that time to start thinking about you know advanced features like savers and lending and whatnot because it just yeah you, you, you gotta walk before you can run do you know what i mean so um, it's pure, it, it is totally respectable if people want to stay true to the original AMM perspective, right? I get it. it they're not wrong, right? They're not, it's not a bad position. It makes complete sense in a, in a lot of ways, right? Um, at the same time, I can also think about the value of what Savers does. Let's take Savers by itself just for one moment. The value of what Savers does, Right? offering, you know, especially like BDC yield on BDC. That is incredibly valuable for the industry as a whole. To do that in a decentralized way doesn't exist and has never existed until ThorChain really did it. Do you know what I mean? And that in itself is um, how, um, how Celsius and BlockFi and all those guys with tens of billions of dollars, you know, had, had grown in part from, from that kind of earning. Or yeah, but they also fraud. exploded though, right? <laughs> or imploded. Well, that's, completely, that's, that's not a fair comparison because the reason why they exploded is because they took people's Bitcoin and, and other assets and they just like started like throwing it to other locations, making like risky, risky, like, you know, uh, m motions with those things. That's it's not, it's not fair. To, to make yeah, I, I get what you're saying. I'm just right. I'm throwing it out there, right? That's what a lot of normies are going to think, though. Just like, hey, this is this is like that. Therefore, that might prevent me from investing in room because the perceived risk is higher than the actual risk. Yeah, and I, and I, to be fair, like that's true, and that's also true with like Terra, right? Terra created a lot of PTSD and a lot of people in the industry, and a lot, of the, and and rightfully so. They're they're more. Um, uh, skeptical, right, of like projects in general, which is I think is actually generally a, a positive thing for the industry. But um, if you wanted to build something like a savers, right, or lending for that matter, 
you you have to do it with an AMM. You can't you can't have savers without the AMM. It doesn't make sense. It won't work, right? Same thing with lending. You can't do lending without the AMM as well. So, like, if you wanted to go that direction to provide these extra services that, in their own right, are just as important and as valuable as the AMM, if not more so. You have to do it with the AMM. Now, you can you can make arguments, right? And we've had discussions in the past about like the conceptual idea of like forking Thorchain and have one of the two chains be like, you know, the the static, you know, uh, AMM basic, you know, base kind of model if you want to call it that, and then another one that's kind of about the more advanced DeFi protocols that are, you know, breaking the mold in many respects, right? And by doing a fork, you know, people who feel that one way can go on one side, and when people feel the other way, they can go on the other side, blah, blah, blah. And, and maybe that happens. I have no idea. I'm not a, future, I'm not a predictor of the future. But um, it is the value of these things, the value of ThorChain being able to accomplish cross-chain liquidity and having an AMM is just one thing that it can do and one, how it can contribute to the industry and contribute to the space. It's capable of doing much, much more. Now, if you want to keep things just to the AMM space, and, and, and effectively doing what Chainflip's doing, right? Chainflip's in, in the in the chat here. Chainflip's just doing the AMM thing, right? And, and and that's their choice, and that's a respectable choice to be made, right? Now, do we want to sit in the same boat as, as as Chainflip and just try to compete with them in some sense, and you know, uh, cross chain liquidity, blah blah blah, swapping grants? Maybe, maybe some people feel that way, right? But if there's a capability to do something like a savers or like a lending or something like this, of offering uh, um, decentralized uh, finance primitives for arbitrarily any chain or asset, especially for something as important as Bitcoin, there's a lot of value there to be, to be, to be gained by the industry, a lot, a lot of value. So um, it is up to not me or, or familiar cow or anybody else, it's up to the nose and the community to decide which direction they want to go. And to be honest, neither perspective is right or necessarily wrong. It's just how you feel about things, right? So it's at some point in the future, we can talk about things. Like, so for example, like, you know, lending is pretty close to the cap, right? It's like 96.6 right now or something like this, right? So we, we might be talking about in the near future about what we want to do with lending. Now we could say, uh, we don't like Thorfi and we don't want to go further down this road. So let's just, you know, sunset the feature and then allow loans to be closed but not opened. And eventually lending will just kind of, you know, die out on its own. Maybe that's the thing that people want to do. Maybe people want to, you know, raise the capital. But like so, why, so why is the community so split, though? Because it seems a little bit polarizing when I go on Twitter and some people are like, oh, the devs. It's not decentralized because the devs were already kind of moving in this direction without approval. Like that's what I'm seeing, and I I I don't know if my timeline is just like that or everyone's is like that. But like, why? What is the polarization stemming from? Well, first of all, devs can't do anything. Like literally, they don't. Have, they don't. In the end, the nodes control anything and and everything. So devs just can't just move forward with anything without the nodes just either being complacent and just like not doing anything or them just allowing it. No, no operators to, to allow any any and all changes, right? So that's one thing to be clear. The The difference is like, the reason why people are so polarized is because some people are uh, more risk on and some people are more risk off, right? And I think um, for like people like Pluto and other people like, um, especially on the non-realm side, they're coming from a more like, let's just keep it simple and basic and, you know, do the, basic AMN thing, whereas myself and Lena are more on the mentality of um, there's a lot we can do with this, um, you know, sky is a limit, let's, you know, let's not just have ThorChain be a $20 billion protocol, let's, let's be $100 billion, $200 billion, right, like whatever. We can, we can, my viewpoint, we can get there, that's just in my, just my personal two cents, right, but if you want to keep things, if people like Pluto or others want to keep things more basic and, you know, or whatever, I mean that's perfectly fine. But like, but people are polarized because uh, people are scared. In effect, like people are scared from, uh, you know, to use your your Celsius BlockFi reference that you made earlier. People are scared because of terror, terror, you know, collapse, blah blah blah. Right? And like, that's just 
the state of the industry as a whole of just being more reserved, right. And more, you know, afraid of, uh, um, uh, death spirals and things of the such. So basically what you're saying is you don't want rune to be a pussy coin. <laughs> you want to go for glory. That's what you're saying. That's funny. Cause like, Bruce, that, that, and, and I, and I say that as like jokingly, but serious at the same time, cause it's like, Hey man, if you're here in crypto and you really want to change the world of finance, you can play it safe and like not do anything. That's, I feel like there's so many of those protocols and coins out there. And it's like, they know they can raise some money and they can get to a certain market cap. And then they become, you know, people become extra liquidity for the founders. They're out, they got rich, but they didn't really make a true difference. And then it's just a fucking slow bleed all the way back down to zero or 99% retracement over time. And then it's gone. Right. So I respect the fact that you guys are definitely trying to, uh, it sounds like evolve and adapt based off of tech upgrades that you guys are facilitating, right? It wasn't a part of the original vision with what you're saying, the Thorify, but it's like as you guys improve tech and then you view current market conditions and what other people have done and you've learned, you guys realize that you can also partake in, you know, uh, different feature builds and whatnot. So I, I get it. I'm, I'm in the software world myself. So um, I understand it's like, it's there's a lot of different directions to take and I, you're going to upset. You can't please all the people all the time is what it sounds like to me more so than anything else. Um, but there could be, so like one group of people could be upset, the original people who want to play it safe, but then you bring in a whole new batch of people into this ecosystem that want to use these other products. And I'm assuming in your vision, Chad, like that, new group of people that gets onboarded is much larger than the, the group that's bitching or complaining today. Well, I don't know. I don't know. what. I really don't have any sense of size, right? So you can make an argument that people are not investing in Rune because they, they don't like, you know, Thorfa features. And you can make an argument that people are investing in Rune because of the Thorfa, Thorfa features. And then to be honest, I don't have a good sense of the size of either of those two parties, to be honest, right? Nor would I, would I consider Rune to be a quote pussy coin or in it for the glory, as you said earlier in your, in your message there, but like, it's not about, it's just about, um, I see from my perspective, I see there's a lot of opportunity to do things that nobody else in the industry is capable of even doing. Most people in this industry, aren't even have the stack to, to accomplish the things that we can accomplish. And what we can do theoretically is we can provide services that are critically important and critically valuable and far exceed everything else in the market. Right? Let's, let's just assume for a moment that lending works as, as design and, and just make the assumption for, for one second. That would be one of the most important advancements in, in, in DeFi we've seen in fucking five years. Like, and I don't think you can reasonably argue with me on this, right? But, but, but that's obviously making the assumption that it works. And I don't know that it works. And we won't really actually know whether it works or not until the end of the next bear market, which was, you know, four years away or whatever the hell the number is, right? To be fair. So it's perfectly valid for people to have the viewpoints they have. And I understand what that is polarizing. And I don't want to drive a stake through the middle of the ThorChain community on this topic, especially not now. Right now, I want to stay focused on, you know, the things that are important for Q1 that we've already kind of talked about as a community and kind of agreed, generally agreed upon. It's not really controversial or whatever, like minimalist transactions and, you know, getting, um, you know, uh, scalability. Like we just did Swap our Club, for example, and that was like a, a, a that significantly improved the speed at which trades and swaps are done on the, on the network. So like at some point, we can talk about those things. And to be honest, even much like Rune Vault 2.0, I'm not even sure I'm a fan of it. You know, I've, I haven't even read the issue personally. I know I kind of understand it at, a, at a, like a general high level, but there's questions and concerns, legitimate questions, legitimate concerns to have around it, and which just requires more time of research and understanding and vetting and blah, 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 before we can actually like go down that road, you know. But to be honest, nobody's really pushing for it to be done now or anytime soon for that matter. Probably not even Q2. I, 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 would, I would, wouldn't even want to see it within, you know, a Q2 time frame, right? If we see it at all, right? So, but for right now, I'm more, I'm more focused on just, let's just fix, you know, bugs. Let's 
scale the network, right? Let's get ARBs to be more efficient. Let's get um, memoless transactions, maybe order books. Um, I don't know what. But there's a lot to be done in the interim, for sure. Yeah, I definitely agree. The, the short term and midterm alignment is all there. And like, I mean, for myself personally, like, like I, I really see the value in a lot of Thorfi features. It's just making sure that things are, are safe for the network. And obviously, you, you're not blowing up LPs through uh, a basically unhinged Sabres um, exposure where they're taking on their own IL and Sabres IL, essentially, and not having the risk of blowing up LPs or, um, you know, with with lending, minting Rune, which is obviously like a core part of the mechanics behind it, which is why there's been so much research that went into like the, the design and implementation of the lending system. So it's like, I don't know. I, I think I think the community is kind of in the middle where it's not just like, oh, like we only need to be the AMM, which I'm sure there's some people that, that truly believe that. But at the same time, there's definitely a ton of room for innovation. Uh, but it's just doing things in a safe and, and scalable way where, you know, there aren't going to be people that are completely blown up in in the protocol doing it, especially with with savers or, or lending. Uh, like given this, the pure design of the protocol, you know, it, it, with the AMM itself, the risk that the that the LP takes is impermanent loss, and uh, it's changed a lot since the, the first days of the protocol. Where now they're taking on their own IL risk and they take on savers IL risk, and we introduce things like protocol and liquidity in order to decrease that risk, but protocol and liquidity isn't infinitely scalable, right? So it's just like, the it's all just trying to answer the question, like, how do we curtail all of the risks of DoorFi and, you know, make this thing just a incredibly powerful protocol where obviously you can do the swaps, you can do savers, you can do lending, but do everything in a safe way where people still have access to the features, but in a way where, uh, you know, things aren't going to go sideways given uh, whatever kind of price action because obviously if something can happen, then it will happen. So it's just protecting against all the risks uh, that could potentially come in, you know, in the next bear market or who knows, like it could come uh, whenever. So just making sure that people are protected, especially, you know, especially liquidity providers, which everything on ThorChain is built around dual LP and, uh, you know, pairing asset with Rune. So the question is just how how to do that safely. Yeah, it's how to do that safely. Obviously, um, that's why we launch features. You know, with caps. That's why we have um, backstop circuit breaker things that we have been talking about for a long time. But also, like. One of the reasons why we started to go down the Thorfire Road in, in general was just, it was just trying to address what we saw to be, or what myself and at least Lena had saw to be like problematic problems with, with the currently the original design, meaning that like, can we grow TVL to be a reasonably, you know, higher amount? You can't, you're not going to become the biggest exchange in the world with, with 200 million in TVL. It just, it's not going to happen. It's just, it's just, there's just not enough liquidity, right? And by it, it kind of forcing everybody to be a dual LP and be, ever being exposed to room, the amount of people who are willing to be LPs is a lot less than somebody who's willing to do, you know, Ethereum and, and USDC, for example, right? And that's what Chainflip has done. Like, Chainflip has kind of opted to say, you know what, we're not going to force people to hold flip tokens to become dual LPs. We're going to have them be holders of USDC and we're going to have them be holders of ETH or whatever. Um, and by doing so, they're making a trade-off. They're saying, um, we're going to make it easier for people to be LPs in some sense or be exposed to the assets they want to be exposed to. But at the same time, they're just going to say, we don't really care about economic security. So, the, And that's just the trade-off, right? And so we could theoretically do the same thing if we really wanted to. Do you want to do away with economic security and, and start coming with new designs that allow us to scale L TVL more so than it is now through that mechanism? I mean... There's not much of a taste for that, at least from my perspective, or anybody that I've spoken to. So, like, it, I'm even like what we have. Even if you just keep everything vanilla, um, it remains to be seen that that is enough to accomplish the task of what this protocol is is trying to accomplish.
Fox McLeod, do you have something you want to add or, or to an A? Thank you for letting me speak. I have a little question, guys. With my our appreciation to you, uh, can Torchain and Torfi split in two different paths? This is my question. Uh, two different what? Two different paths. Two different ways. Um, I mean, it can be forked into two different chains. That's that's a you know something we could discuss as a community at some point in the in the distant future. But parts within the same chain, I don't think so. The only way you could do that is you, you would need to create like two different tokens. It's like the Rune token, which is like the AMM, and then there's a new token called Rune version. Uh, Rune Thorfi, I don't know. Uh, but then you create a, se a separation of the um, collective value that the protocol is, is pulling in. So it's theoretically possible, I suppose, but I, I'd have some concerns around it. Thank Hello. You. Hey, what's up? Hey, how are you? M Mike, can you guys hear me? Yep, go for My it. question is, how do you guys expect the future advances in Thorchain to affect the price of Rune? Yeah, I don't really have an answer to that question, to be honest. It's kind of a arbitrary question with no real answer to it. Okay. Like, I mean, I guess, like, if you think about it in, in terms of just the AMM side of things... Rune's price would move with with its adoption, right? With its its volume, right? If you think about it in terms of like um, Thorfi, it's a different mechanism and it and it has a different effect, right? And and Rune's price would would clearly do better, assuming that Thorfi works and there's no you know calamities of any kind. Obviously, th Rune's price would do better with Thor 5 than without it because you have m multiple d of multiple demand centers for the asset. Yeah. The more demand centers you have for an asset, or the more significant the size of those demand centers are, clearly the price would you know, be relative to that. So if you keep things simple with on the AMM side, Rune can still go to 100 bucks theoretically. I'm not saying it's, it is. No one quote me as I'm giving price predictions or anything like this. But even if, if you just leave the AMM by itself, could Rune go to 100 bucks? Yeah, that's totally possible. Totally possible. If you added, you know, lending and other things with it, can it go higher than that? Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, it's, it's, it's just, Rune can be successful with, without it, without Thorfight, possibly, likely. I don't know. It's hard to say, to be honest, but like, Having more demand centers for an asset makes it more. Yeah, yeah. makes it more. Uh, and those and having legitimate demand centers, obviously, like Terra doing like fixed rate twenty percent, blah blah blah, is not legitimate. But yeah, okay, perfect. Thank you. Hey guys, just joined here. This is Pluto. I'm just curious if we were to deploy the sixty million rune that's in the standby reserve into POL. Doesn't that remove sixty million rune worth of organic demand? Like, if all, if the if the protocol is just putting up all the rune side, where's the demand coming from in Thorfi? Sorry, I don't know, I don't know what you mean by organic demand. Like in a in just a traditional vanilla dual LP, people need to buy rune in order to provide the other side of the liquidity. If the protocol reserve is putting up all the rune and allowing savers to just enter with exogenous assets, where how is Thorfi actually creating demand for rune? Oh, um, yeah. So the trade volume of the protocol is is directly correlational, not necessarily in a one to one kind of way with its TVL. So as you increase the TVL of a protocol, generally speaking, the vol volume goes with it, right? And, and, and this volume goes with it, you also get higher price execution, better price execution, right? Because the pool is, is, has more uh, liquidity to it and it's, got, it's more capital efficient in a, in a lot of ways. And so it's beneficial to the asset in general because you're going to naturally see a higher volume of trading and better price execution. But Savers was never really necessarily designed for uh, 
causing room price to go up necessarily. It, 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 its design primarily was to increase the TVL of the network, in which case it's done that quite successfully, rather successfully. Lending was more designed for the idea of like creating a, a strong demand center for the rune asset by creating more buy and burn pressure. That's, that's, that's more of what it was designed. It's the primary thing that it's trying to achieve in the lending design. But because lending has been very subdued in a sense, we've, we've capped it at a very small cap and over a long period of time, it hasn't had that effect, which is not really surprising either because would, the, the goal of lending you know, over the last like few months or whatever is not about trying to get rooms priced to, to go to 30 bucks or whatever. The goal was just to, to test the idea, to experiment with a small, do a small experimentation and understand if the assumptions that are made in the design uh, pan out to the market. Thus far, it's been true. Like everything, everything about lending thus far has been nothing but green flags. There hasn't been a red flag in lending that I can remember right now. Everything's been green flags so far. It's been doing very well relative to what we expect it to do. The only thing that hasn't happened is some large market adoption of it, which, you know, that's not going to happen with a 1% cap, that's, which is what we expected anyway. Yeah, I just with the with with POL, it's it's just like you're basically replacing organic demand for room to for providing the other side of dual sided liquidity, and you're just basically saying, okay, that'll come from reserve, that'll come from supply that is currently not circulating. So, I what I feel like would be a better way to create organic demand for room, I, I, and I'm sure the word organic is not maybe the correct word. But to create actual demand for rune, people other than the protocol buying it and putting it into pools. And if you if you were to just take that sixty million in the standby reserve right now, like because clearly the, the protocol works without that today. If you were to just take that and just burn the whole thing and reduce the supply of uh, of rune from I don't know whatever it is right now, you know total supply like four hundred eighty four million, and you were to make that four hundred twenty four million, like. You're basically creating, you're, there's less room now in circulation, and then people have to buy it in order to provide liquidity. Like, I just don't, I just don't see why, like, do, like, like, dual LP will work if the yields are high enough, if there's enough demand for swapping, cross-chain swapping, which is, like, the bread and butter of this protocol. It just naturally follows that people will provide liquidity. It, it will become attractive enough to the point where people will see it. Like, I just want to see dual LPs making money again. And then, like, if they're making money again, it's because, like, they don't have this like there's not like just room being put into the pools by the protocols people are actually like buying it to put it in there yeah but i think the thing you're missing is that it doesn't matter what the apys are of being a dual lp if you just don't want to hold room like, like you could put it 300 fucking percent doesn't matter if you, if you don't want to hold room you don't want to be price exposed to room, then it doesn't matter if you're getting 300 percent just not worth the risk right and by the way, burning sixty million of the standby reserve a does not reduce circulation. Circulation reserve funds do not include in circulation. But b it wouldn't create any kind of long term economic value. It just create a a, a a tweet thread and maybe a, a short term pump. Which by the way, we did that a long time ago. We burnt originally the supply of rune was was one billion tokens, and um, you know back in I think twenty nineteen I think it was maybe early twenty twenty we burned half the supply. Right, and did we see a, a massive bump in, in price? Yeah, there was a there was a bump, but it wasn't. I don't even think it. I don't even think that the price doubled from memory. That was a long time ago, though. So maybe I'm mis misremembering. But it's it, that's not a it's not a sustainable. It doesn't create sustainable growth in the protocol by burning sixty million or whatever. Yeah, I'd just rather see that never go into circulation in the first place. Yeah, and you're, the reason why you're saying that is because you're looking at Rune as, in terms of its monetary policy, you know? And and I get why you're, you're looking at things that way, and I think you're, you'd be probably in the in the commonality in that sense. But the reality is that Rune is not a, a money, right? It's never been designed to be a money, right? It's, it's not trying to compete about against Bitcoin, right, or anything like this. It's barely even a fucking utility. It's 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 really there primarily to offer security more than any other, any other thing, and and offer um, more capital efficient ways of like you know not having a thousand different Bitcoin pools 
with a thousand different pairs or whatever. So it, it has a role, but it, its role is not primarily to be a, a money where it has a good monetary policy like Bitcoin does or whatever else. Like, there's a part of me that thinks that, like, if I were to do it all over again, then, like, I wouldn't maybe not even create a, a cap on rune supply just because it distracts from um, distracts from what it's actually trying to achieve, right? You're investing into rune not because you think it's a good store of value. You're investing it because it, you believe that it's going to be adopted into the future and get more trade volume and have more um, demand for it, right? Because the tokenomics of, of, of rune is... is is, is designed in a, in a way that's, that its growth move, moves with the growth of the protocol, unlike, you know, UniToken or Sushi or these other DeFi tokens that are just governance tokens. But again, like, I, I, don't even, I haven't even read that whole proposal of the 60 million thing. That's an idea that somebody floated in that concept of, and I haven't even read it, to be honest. Hey, uh, Mariano, what's up? So I want to segment into uh, the roadmap and couple that with the, the recent discussion on the dual LP and the 2.0 uh, idea. I've seen uh, rapid swaps stream and it seems like we could do a lot of volume without much TVL. So Firsthand, I would put uh, the priority for us to, you know, discuss how to get there faster <laughs> or instead of, you know, thinking that TVL will, will mean the world. There, there, there could you be say how to get up. there faster? What, what do you mean? Um, instead of like wasting, I mean, not wasting, but instead of, you know, picking fights over this dual P discussion, see how the protocol works after rapid swaps. If... If there will be a necess you know, a necessity to uh, give LPs a, a the non rune option as a priority, if that makes sense, uh, you, you know what I mean. Uh, so you once we deliver, you know, you, once devs deliver rapid swaps, we can do a a cross, you know, a cross check to see if the TV like the the pros and cons are are still there for. For any big switch, I think you know uh, another. Wait, so my question. Let me step back a little bit. My question is: How did this discussion start, and how after this ADR, how it will evolve? Will it eventually go to the if it doesn't pass? How does the governance uh, take this into account? You know, in the back end by the development teams on the dual LP uh, discussion. If we're going to eventually, uh, so my point I, I'm trying to make is first, I, I would prioritize, you know, uh, rapid swaps. I think that that makes a huge difference for capital efficiency, execution, all that good stuff. And then, you know, segment that into how governance works in a way that, uh, how would we, we do this even before rapid swaps in a way. Yeah, and this stuff is definitely not put in front of, uh, like, it's the, all this new, like, Rune Vault and things like that are not put in front of things like order books. Like, order books is on the, the near-term priority list, so, like, Q1, Q2 list of, of priorities to go out. And uh, Rapid Swaps is, I believe, part of the uh, order book design. So th that's something that's already, like, coming in the short to, to mid-term over the next couple months. Um, so that, that's already something that's, that's, like, in motion and and happening uh, right now. And like, as for how we kind of got here, is just a, a like a proposal from, you know, from one of the devs uh, for, for this thing, uh, which I believe it was originally presented as like, this is what's happening. And then like, you know, and then it kind of got into like, well, not everyone really agrees with this direction. So now it's kind of just like, here's this proposal. And uh, eventually there's probably going to there be some kind of vote on this, probably an ADR happening over the next, you know, a couple weeks or months, but definitely not uh, trying to distract from the short to midterm priorities of, uh, you know, shipping things like order books, uh, which includes rapid swaps, memoless transactions, batched outbounds, and uh, all the things that are like actual priorities that can uh, 
present an improvement over the entire design right now that are you know, entirely non-controversial and uh, already determined to be an area of focus for the next couple months. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I just think that the, the rapid swap is going to be the one of the major impacts on, on how much volume can go through. Streaming swaps was probably the first step there. But streaming swaps in combination with normal speed swap, uh, synth speed swaps is, is definitely a game changer. And uh, I think Lena to, uh, talked about how uh, synths mints are actually positive for, for Rune, supposed to mint, uh, to pump Rune, so, which kind of contradicts what Chad recently said that synths weren't really meant to pump Rune, lending was, uh, but synth burns actually dumps Rune. So what she said, I don't know if she or he, or he, that we should all stop with the POL matching synth mints and let Saver's uh, TVL increase, which Fortune makes money with TVL, which is something I kind of disagree with once we have rapid swaps because it's kind of like a, a, a just-in-time liquidity, if you will, for, for uh, arbitragers, which will kind of sand sandwich with the order books. If you know they don't order book, they will uh, as 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 they will they will do synth, and and if synths are gone, they will do L one arbing. So it it kind of still extracts away uh, the value that LPs get, and that's a good thing. That that means we can process a lot of more value. Just want to make sure there that uh, I, I made my point about how much volume can go through. So, and uh, thank God that we'll have rapid swaps before any of this, uh, you know, potentially goes through. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing I'd say to that is, is that um, if you have a car, right, and you want to upgrade your car and make it faster, you know, to, uh, as a race car or whatever, you can't just focus on one component of the car, right, like the muffler, Right or the 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 hum, whatever. Like you have to think holistically, and so as you upgrade, you know, one component, you know, you, sh you probably want to upgrade a different component, right? Because because the other component becomes the bottleneck of the speed of the car or the performance of the car. You don't just want to keep on focusing on, you know, upgrading the engine, but never touch the wheels or its aerodynamics or other things, right? And so like. What we've always said for many years now is that the, the three kind of important pillars of the protocol is that we always want to be scaling security, we want to be scaling t scaling TVL, and we want to be scale scaling uh, volume, right? And we do this through many mechanisms or many uh, uh, ways of accomplishing these things, but we're constantly kind of like shifting a position on what thing we're focusing on, right? We used to focus on security during the, the bear market when, when security was a problem. We focused on you know, TVL with savers until savers launch, and we haven't been focused on that for, you know, a while now. And ever since that, we've been focusing mo mostly on swaps, which is what streaming swaps came, and, it, and you know, maybe rapid swaps, another example of that, you know, so forth and so on. So it's just like we have to think holistically and think about what, what is the bottleneck of the protocol and how do we improve that, right, That whatever that thing might be. And it's going to shift and it's going to change. It's going to be like whack-a-mole as soon as you... You know, improve the volume. You're going to want to p improve the the effectiveness of the TVL, the effectiveness of the ARBs, and so we're constantly kind of shifting positions or shifting focus more accurately to improve one component so that, that because it's the largest bottleneck of the protocol. Largely, I've been focused on not volume ever since streaming swaps. I've been not focusing on TVL. I've been not focused on security. I've actually been mostly focusing on ARBs myself over the last you know, month or two to make them faster, more efficient, more, you know, be able to get their, their, their confirmation counts done in, put into the network quicker to get their, their output, their outbound transactions out faster by software cloud, you know, trader counts. Another thing to increase capital efficiency of ARB so they can ARB with 2x more efficiency than they're, than they're currently doing uh, with, with synthetics. And, you know, and again, even with the, the rapid swaps. Another thing to make arbitrage bots more effective, to make them to, to scale the protocol and that methodology, and that that perspective. But we're gonna always just be like every you know few months or six months or whatever it is to be like, all right, we've now maxed out the the efficiency of ARBs. We've, we've added four new features to make ARBs faster, better, so we have better price execution, 
be a better volume, that kind of thing. And maybe you want to focus on something else at that point. Yeah, it makes sense. Just to wrap that up, for us investors of Rune, it would be much better to have higher TVL that would correlate with price due to deterministic pricing and incentive pendulum and uh, a speculative multiple on top of the deterministic price. So, uh, you know, all gears towards that for sure. Thank you, guys. And uh, one thing that I guess we should address real quick, because a lot of people, I see a lot of comments on this, and obviously on Discord too, just about Twitter comms. So like, obviously there's a lot of contributors. There's, there's a couple different contributors to the ThorChain Twitter account. And, uh, you know, people people post things on here. Like, you know, I, I, like I, I post things, uh, others do too. And, you know, no, no one should take anything that's posted on this account as fact. But at the same time, uh, we definitely need to, to do better just making sure that, um, you know, the, the mouthpiece of the protocol, which obviously this is not an official account. It doesn't speak for the protocol. Only, only the, the nodes can speak for the protocol. But at the same time, a lot of people look towards, you know, this account and obviously like the community to, for the signal of like what's going on. And when, when the Twitter account says like this, this thing is, is happening or this is what is going to happen, um, when that's not like a, an agreed upon decision or, um, you know, that is not the clear direction that, that things are moving in or it's a controversial decision or, or whatever. Uh, like, I mean, I believe that the Twitter account should only be posting things that are in the, in the, in the will of the, of the node operators and the devs at that time. So it's like, if things can change, uh, th things will, will change over time inevitably, but um, obviously, we we just need to do better as a as a community to make sure that people understand that um, you know there's gonna there's always gonna be these proposals like hey we should do this we should do that but just you know having clear communications because this is where people get their signal of like what's happening and it, it only it confuses people when they see things that like oh this is happening like I don't understand what this is or what you know it's so sudden when in reality. You know, if changes were to take place, they'd be many months from now after a lot of um, a lot of discussion and, and decision. But uh, I, you know, it's just not the place of the of the Twitter to be um, you know saying things to, to happen as as they could be in the future um, without some kind of like clear signal of that is the the direction which everyone agrees to to, to go down. So. Yeah, I mean, that's something I, I, you know, I take upon myself too, just to like make sure that the sort of Twitter comms are, you know, clean and factual and professional. But uh, obviously, there's other contributors too, so um, just want everyone to keep that in mind. But I'm going to continue to do my best to, you know, provide good comms for for the community and make sure that there's clear signal on like what people agree upon and what I, I what I interpret as the direction of the of the protocol, uh, you know, as agreed upon by the nodes and the devs and, and the, and the greater community. So just wanted to call that out because I see a lot of people that are just confused about things that this account, uh, tweets out when maybe not all of it will, you know, come to fruition one day. So, yeah. Yeah, I would just say that, like, you know, for better or for worse, like, when you operate a truly decentralized network, these types of hiccups happen, you know, solely due to the fact that there is not some centralized figure or authority who's kind of calling the shots. Like, it does consist of multiple stakeholders, each that have their own preferences that sometimes pull in different directions, except the part that what we can do better on is sort of aligning internally on those things first. And so, like, ideally... Like, the Twitter should not be a place where other devs learn about other devs' ideas and proposals. Those, those conversations should, should happen outside of the view of the public. And then once the idea is fully formed and ready to be taken to sort of the next tier of, of feedback, it should be taken within, you know, the Discord dev community, which contains longtime contributors, nodes, investors, LPs, and then once all of that sort of semi-public discussion happens, which again, that, that, that discussion is completely public, but it's still like not as public as Twitter. Only once there's like full consensus within the community should things be happening on the actual public Twitter. 
probably Twitter should just be like, honestly, you know, discussing things that either already have consensus and will certainly happen in the near term future or things that already have happened. Like, you know, for example, I would love to see us talking about Swapper Cloud, for example. And I, I did join a little bit late, but that was an, a major thing that went out this week, um, which I'm sure you guys already touched on. But and it's always going to be better to just keep this forum to, like, factual, you know, uh, uh, looking into the past or into the very near future of things that absolutely will be happening. Yeah, 100%. It looks chaotic because, you know, obviously there's a lot of contributors that, that do their own thing and have their own, like, idea of the way to do things. But I totally agree. Like, the, the flow of information should always be, you know, someone has an idea, they, you know, talk to others in private on, you know, the merits of that idea and develop it into a proposal. And then that, that goes to, to, to GitLab, someone makes an issue, and then people start talking about it on Discord uh, with, and Twitter spaces and things like that. Um, like, I, I feel like that's a good discussion, a good place to talk about things that are, you know, maybe just proposals, but they're, you know, slightly, uh, slightly formed or more fully formed than just like a, an original idea. And then once there's some kind of consensus on like, hey, this is a good idea or like, this seems solid enough where there's at least going to be a vote on it, then that, that kind of moves to the public forum of, of Twitter where there's like, you know, there's so many, so many eyes here and then they, and what people see is just kind of uh, chaos or, or they think that something's happening when in reality it's just like a, a proposal or something that may not ever come to fruition or it's just one person's idea. So yeah, that's my thoughts on that. But yeah, we'll continue to, uh, you know, try and strive for the great standard of comms that I think uh, we all want. So Keep pushing in that direction. Well, let's hear from from Ken, and then after Ken, we can we can move on to Swapper Cloud because we actually haven't, haven't really talked about that quite yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do um, well. Let's do Eric first, and then and then Ken. Uh, Eric, Eric's been waiting, and then uh, yeah, let's talk about Swapper Cloud and some other things. Are uh, you there, Eric? Yeah. E hi. Give me one. Oh no. Yeah. No. Uh, so hey, sorry about that, guys. Um. So. Appreciate you. Let me let me talk. Uh, I had like two questions. One because I remember hearing you someone say that the lending part was kind of like a test, like kind of we were testing the lending. So one question was for that is did was it uh, considered for like physical assets, like for example how banks can provide or. Uh, title loans, right? So a physical asset is collateral as well. Did you guys possibly take that um, or think about that for, for an option as well for investors? No, we, we don't deal with any kind of physical assets. We're purely in the crypto space. If you try to get into the physical world, it just becomes points of centralization and uh, against the ethos of the project. Understood, understood. Okay, okay. Um, Okay, no, then that, that kind of eliminates my, my next question. I appreciate it. Uh, the, the one thing I did want to know was um, actually uh, if, because I, I want to be a part of this project and I want to contribute to it a whole lot. However, I don't have any type of coding experience. I don't know how to any of this, the, the talents and skills that you guys hold, but I do have knowledge and resources in the real estate world and even though you guys said you as the project doesn't take part in it if i were to have started a company and and i wanted to be a part of it would that something like that um because i want to get i want to get housing and and the, the 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 profits and benefits to the housing markets uh into the project um the, at least the money the money-wise revenue into it. I want to start generating money from housing um, into ThorChain. And if that would be the only way that I would be able to contribute, would something like that also have to be uh, uh, as a proposal? Or would I? Or would we talk basically at the Rare Evo event? Because I ended up buying my ticket there too. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll just hop into this one because I've actually thought about a, a lot about this as well um, and how like ThorChain lending can you know, displace the need for people to sell off their Bitcoin to make investments in other asset classes. So like you can, you know, for example, I don't think anything that you're, um, you know, you're talking about is going to get added into the, like the core protocol of DoorChain, but you could potentially, you know, create 
um, some sort of like you know package of real estate assets, refinance them using Bitcoin loans from um, Thorchain Lending. So basically, like collect um, Bitcoin from LPs, then take out loans on Thorchain using LPs Bitcoin, and then use those assets to like you know refinance mortgages on real world assets, or just buy assets outright. And then basically pay back your LPs um, as you you know pay off those loans you know from the uh, the actual revenue that you make from them. There's there's tons of businesses that can be built on top of Thorchain, but there's no chance whatsoever that like there's going to be you know real estate assets added to Thorchain. And I, I can probably say pretty definitively that that's just not to Chad's point. It goes against the ethos of the protocol. Okay, no, understood, and I totally love what uh, your point and everything that you just said, um, like the plan. I'm going to have to go over that and research it a little bit more, but I love the the process that you just explained, so I'm going to dig deeper and, and then uh, reach back out on the next one. Appreciate you guys. Much love. Thanks, man. Uh, what's up, Cam? What's up, guys? Uh, been a very interesting interesting week for Torchain. Uh, I'm, I'm glad. Um, to feel um, feel like the project is the real thing, like people are arguing uh, over the the roadmap and everything. Um, so the way I understand is like uh, when I, when we look at the near uh, uh, near term upgrades, I kind of summarize them in, in three buckets. It's like memos, transactions, uh, swapper cloud, which you guys are going to talk about next, um, and then there's the order books. Out of those three, um, the one that kind of like excites me the most is is uh, is the order books. Um, I kind of want to hear more about uh, uh, like where where the consensus is at um, regarding its design and implementation. Uh, whether there's like an agreement uh, to a certain level uh, between like nine realms and and, and the core team uh, with regards to uh, yeah those like its details. Um, like some of the some of the things I'm curious uh, to to learn about is basically like uh, I saw a proposal about this uh, quote unquote uh, a new asset type as known as like trade assets, uh, which would be uh, a more capital efficient asset uh, to use uh, relative to since um, when, when to do ARBs and and place order uh, pl place limit orders. Um, so. Like how confident we are uh, in terms of uh, adopting like trade assets, um, that would be like one question. Um, and the reason, like just just for context, like the reason I'm interested in this is because I think uh, I want to like uh, underscore like Mariana's point here. I feel like you know with, with streaming swaps, like um, they really unlocked a big uh, opportunity for Torchain. Like before streaming swaps, uh, it was like. In my mind, it was like TVL was one of the top priorities, right? Like the, the pool sizes. Um, however, like with streaming swaps, if you break down a swap into 10, the pools, like the effect of pools is, is almost, uh, it's like 10 times bigger. And if you break it down to the 200, you can like treat pools as if like they're, they're 100, 100x uh, uh, deeper. And like with order books, um, uh, like there's a very plausible plan to make streaming swaps like shorter. So I feel like, you know, I, um, like double clicking on what Mariana said, I, I feel like, you know, once it's out there and we experience the results uh, out there, we, we're, we're quickly going to realize that like the torch chain like doesn't need that larger pools um, in order to get where it wants to be. But yeah, that's just my, my two cents. Well, I think the design of order books was pretty much established at this point. It's already been coded, and there hasn't really been any pushback from any of the other devs or community members about its implementation details. It's already it's actually been in the code um, for a long time. There's some new things to be added to support streaming swaps within order books, and that I kind of like some work to be done around that. But you're right in the sense that. Um, streaming swaps kind of allows you to have the price execution of you know pools that are ten times deeper and getting it to that, to getting it now in a sense, and that's and that's, and that's fair and that's an accurate thing to say. Um, 
But you also get like if the pools were ten times, uh, two times deeper right now, um, streaming swaps would be, would be executed twice as fast, right? Now rapid swaps might be you know to ha have execute even faster. And that's kind of what the idea be the idea behind them. But it also requires arbitrage bots to be like mature enough to support such a thing, right? It doesn't guarantee that every every swap will be executed in a single block. It requires arbitrage bots to be, you know, to, to show up, you know, and, and do do their job, right, in a sense. Yeah, that's fair. But, like, like I think there's a very, very real chance that they will be um, because that they're just dollar to be made, right? Um, and, like, in my mind, it's just, like, I almost see it as, as like, a... Um, not not AMM, but it is liquidity that organic swaps will trade against, right? So, like, there's going to be orders, uh, limit orders, and then there's going to be organic swaps. An organic swap is going to execute against the pool immediately after, if if the price satisfies the the uh, limit order, the limit order is going to ex execute against the same pool, but in the different direction. And so, like, it's just going to increase the liquidity and, and make swaps faster, and. Um, and because you can up update your limit order at uh, perhaps like every block, like you can be very sophisticated with that. Like you're not going to necessarily, um, um, uh, like you're not going to experience the, the IL for sure that you experience in an AMM. And um, I, I feel like that plan is like a very uh, real, very, very plausible. And like, um, the, it's a very exciting plan uh, with regards to like how Torchain can become like the, this, you know, um, the, the big project that we uh, all want it to be. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, yeah, that's absolutely true. But, but you can, like, um, here's the bear case for that, right? Uh, chain flips in the audience. And, and so Chain Flips does, has a different model. Instead of using streaming swaps, they're using JIT which is another legitimate way of approaching the same problem in some ways. And like, it's possible that, that chain could have better price execution than Thorchain if it has deep enough pools, right? So we could have more shallow pools than chain flip, but still have better price execution. But that's probably not true if, they, if chain flip has 10 times the, 10 times the pool depth that we do, to be honest with you, right? Depending upon a bunch of different kind of um, variables that we taken into account but I think like I think I mean I definitely agree with you in the sense that I, I, I find rapid swaps or the concept of rapid swaps to be um, pretty valuable and I'm, I'm excited to see it happen and something I'd love to see happen in Q1 maybe Q2 and, and I definitely want to do that before making any changes that you know room vault or anything like this like this I'm not, I'm not interested in those things um, I'd much rather to um Limit orders and, and rapid swaps before we touch anything like that. I'm, I'm with you, Jim. Yeah, if anyone doesn't know what rapid swaps are, it's doing a streaming swap, but using the order book or people that place limit orders or our bots that place limit orders on Thorchain, basically filling a streaming swap all entirely within one block. So instead of needing to wait for uh, for arbs to come in after you make the swap, the arbs have already placed their you know have already placed limit orders where they can make a profit arbing to uh, you know to other exchanges or decentralized exchanges. So you can essentially just fill in your streaming swap in one block, so you can get guaranteed execution uh, and instant execution for your streaming swap. So you're still paying those five basis points of slippage, but you have that guaranteed and instant execution. So it's kind of the best of both worlds for uh, for streaming. And a uh, qu quick question on the implementation of limit orders slash order books. Is that still on top of synthetic assets or uh, like are those, are those built on top of derived assets or trade, trade, uh, trade assets or like w what's the, the primitive that order books are built on top of? Because it seems like we're kind of moving away from synthetic assets besides, um, you know, in the context of savers. So, um, yeah, what's the basis of order books? Right now, uh, at the time that the order book code was written, the the, the thought process there was going to be around synthetics, um, and the reason why that is is you, if you do it around the layer one assets, you have um, unsecured assets on the network, 
you could do it. Like there's nothing, there's, there's nothing technically stopping you from doing so. But now you're you're holding Bitcoin outside of the context of the AMM itself, and therefore it's not like properly secured unless you have additional mechanisms to to, to secure it. So. But I think that the intention now is that uh, is to use trade accounts instead of synthetics, and so we're going to be launching trade accounts probably pretty fairly soon as a project. And I think everybody seems to be for it, and there hasn't been much pushback at all. Um, probably in the next you know few weeks or a month or so, we'll play out of trade accounts that won't obviously support order books off the bat, but you know initially it will just be for ARBs to use primarily. But at some point, you know downstream, uh, another month or two. Of, whatever hell it's going to be, um, we'll open it up so that you can use order books with trade accounts. I'll just offer my, my view on it. Um, you know, I love order books. I want to see order books in ThorChain. Of course, it's a, it's a trading primitive that a lot of people are familiar with, and it, it does unlock things like um, rapid swaps and, you know, just it brings us closer to parity with centralized exchanges, which I think we can all agree is you know, what we're trying to disrupt. Um, it does, you know, it, it does give me pause that, like, they are built on top of synths now um, because we're actively trying to move things away from synths. Like, there's, you know, somewhat of a sentiment in the community held by myself and others that, you know, synth leverage um, is already too high um, and that by introducing order books as a feature, it just adds more demand for synths and you know i just it it doesn't seem like it like launching a feature that relies on synth capacity while simultaneously trying to scale back synth um utilization it, it just it just seems like you're introducing one feature that cannibalizes the capacity of another you're going to have people who are you know trying to add savers simultaneously taking away from the capacity available for order books and vice versa. So it just does seem like a bit of like a cannibalization effort there. I, I personally, I mean, I would love to see if there was, you know, I think there's there other designs have been floated. For example, the idea of like a, a, a liquidating order book, like where your part of your order can get partially liquidated if like the price of some asset falls below a certain amount. We obviously scrapped that idea because that would be like a, a horrible user experience. Um, for people to like place a limit order and then it's like your limit order didn't get filled but you now have less than you put in um, but I, I think one area that we could potentially explore is just the idea of like an expiring limit order where what we allow limit orders and we just allow people to post just the exogenous asset without actually having to swap it to a synth or affect the synth utilization up to the security limit um, which we have plenty of security right now. We're, we're currently very overbonded. Um, and so that would, you know, shift the incentive pendulum back towards, if we just allow people to post exogenous assets, we could just um, use the existing overbonded rune to secure that. So limit orders would really just be um, capped at the amount of excess security at any given moment. And then as we start to approach that amount, um, of the you know of the security cap, we could just start expiring limit orders um, to basically kick them back out. So I mean, because limit orders are naturally a, a short-lived thing, at least in you know I, I've seen some people just like throw on a bunch of orders at like a really really low price and they never get executed, but people want to have them there so that you know if the price of an asset does dip, they can fill it a low a low amount. But I think it would be more it, it would encourage people. So, that, so I guess what, what I'm saying is that you could, you could like, eject or expire a limit order if it's far away from the spot price as we approach that security cap. And then that way, you know, you wouldn't have to do anything. You wouldn't have to change the synth utilization um, in order to allow people to place limit orders. Um, and, you know, it could, it could, it would, I think it would, wouldn't be a terrible user experience if someone, like, paid a fee, you know, to basically place a limit order, or, or rather, you know, what it, you know what it could be? You wouldn't even have to put, paste, place, put the fee to place a limit order. It's just that if your limit order expired due to not being filled after a certain amount of time, you would all you'd basically have having to be doing is paying the outbound fee to send you back your asset. Is, is there any reason why something like that wouldn't work, Chad? Because I, I just, I, I would love if we, if we could avoid having to, you know, lean on synths for any more features. 
Yeah, like I said, I don't, uh, trade accounts um, will be used for ARBs and for order books. I don't think we're going to be using since for... That was the original design, like back when we first talked about order books, like over a year ago. But I think today we, we wouldn't use since at all for this. So you could actually just deposit some Bitcoin, which basically gets tr uh, automatically tr like um, um, traded into a, a, a trade account, which is a one-to-one. -one. It does no fee for that. And then it just sits as a trade a trade asset on the network, waiting for an execution of some price that you're looking. You're waiting for, you know, the Bitcoin ETH price um, to hit some ratio, whatever the hell it is. And then just goes it goes ahead and execute executes. And we can also have like a, just a global expiry, like you know, um, you can't have an order you know longer than three days. I don't know. I'm making up a, a kind of a random example, but. In that way, if, if, if security does become an issue, you know, it, it, within a few, a few short days, all that, you know, kind of exits and you and maybe you won't be able to build new order book items just because of uh, security concerns. I don't know. We have to think, think more of the details, the, the weeds of that. But, but yeah, I don't think we're going to be using SIDS for order books. Yeah. I mean, the problem, the problem with trade accounts is that, like, they can be, the asset in your trade account can be liquidated if the price of rune drops relative to the asset that it's securing correct uh yeah that is part that is that is correct I so, so it, but when we discussed the original like implementation of trade accounts we said that that's an acceptable thing because arbs are you know relatively advanced they're you know they're, they're very advanced actually they're probably the most advanced um actor in the ecosystem um, certainly more so than savers, which is kind of just like I said it and forget it. Trade accounts actually have to like monitor, you know, the the sort of that 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 point at which they get liquidated. But it's fine because you know the trade accounts and synths that are held by ARBs are meant to be relatively short lived. They're just you know the only purpose of holding them is to like rebalance the pools. But if you have you know basically we want to avoid building any product that requires someone who sets like a limit order to actually have to like monitor whether the, you know, the capital that they, that they posted in their limit order m might get liquidated. So that's why I was just thinking like it's, it, it, instead of even ever getting them, as long, if there was some like special mechanism that prevented that from ever happening, like it just, you know, e ejected their order and, you know, basically refunded it less the outbound fee back to the user if they were, you know, e ever anywhere, you know, remotely in danger of getting to that point, like, and then, like, potentially not allowing new limit orders when you're, like, below 10% or whatever from, like, the security cap, then that would at least provide a user experience that, like, prevents people who place limit orders from, from being liquidated. And I do like the idea of, you know, essentially ejecting the people who are furthest from the spot price first because they're the ones who are le least likely to get their order filled. And so most uh, best eligible for having um, their, you know, their, their order ejected. Yeah, I, I do think there's some implementation details to be ironed out. And to be honest, I haven't really thought about it in any kind of depth uh, quite yet because I haven't been focused on trade accounts, the 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 union of tr trade accounts and 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 um, order books. That's just like we're we're a few we're, we're ways away from that from that mentality. But but you're right. Um, one thing to clarify though, there's no like liquidation. It's more accurate to call it like a negative interest is applied to the trade account. It's not like you, we hit some number, and then all of a sudden you lose all your your trade accounts. You get zeroed or anything like Sorry, that. Sorry, yeah, like a, like a partial like a partial liquidation. I mean, you're, you're losing some of the principle that you put in. Like, you yeah. don't want people to like to, you know put a one bitcoin order and then you know we say oh sorry you only have like point nine bitcoin because trade accounts. You know that's like not an acceptable explanation from a UX perspective. Right, and that's why that's partially why I was talking a moment ago about you know if we have a cap on uh, the number of days that a, an order item can can be on 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 the decks, right? Which is what a lot of other decks have done in the past. That's, that's pretty um, common. Um, then the because the 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 math of how the negative interest works, it's not aggressive at all. It's actually quite quite weak in its, in its way that it approaches it for the, for the most part. Um, so it's, it's pretty, it's fairly small. And so the, the, the order would expire 
within a day or two days or three days or whatever the hell the number might be. And, in, and if you do get some kind of negative interest, you're not going to lose like half of your fucking position or whatever. That would be pretty pretty extreme. But it's, it would be rather quite small. I think it's, it's, it's going to be designed to be quite small. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be harsh to achieve its goal. Yeah, totally. I mean, at this point, it feels like we're just kind of going back and forth on the implementation details. I think for anyone like joining late, you know, this is kind of goes to show that like, you know, until a design is sort of agreed upon, things are still very much fluid at all times. And so, you know, the, the introduction of new primitives like trade accounts kind of changes the, uh, the implementation of order books. And, and so like, you know, and it's also like not the kind of thing where we have one chance to get it right. I think order books and their users will be sort of highly experimental and ARBs and advanced people, you know, will be, advanced actors will be sort of the, uh, the beta users of those. So um, as with every feature that we launch on ThorChain, it'll be a, you know, a staggered rollout and we'll, you know, monitor the behavior and see how people, you know, react and respond um, before, you know, before, before at least trying to like roll it out to UIs and stuff, we'll certainly see how, um, you know, other users use the feature. Oleg, what's up, man? Sorry to keep you waiting up here. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I have a few questions on a few topics. So if you wanted to just continue, Cal, um, I'll just uh, ask my questions as we touch the topics. I know you mentioned uh, going to Swapper Cloud next. Yeah, we have a couple of people that requested too. So let's talk about Swapper Cloud. And then if people have related questions, like I don't want to go back to like the previous topics of like Norfi and stuff like that. So let's just keep it kind of moving forward here. Let's talk about Swapper Cloud a little bit because we finally turned on Swapper Cloud uh, earlier this week. And uh, so Swapper Cloud is live. So let's kind of dive into like what Swapper Cloud is and you know what kind of improvement that should make over this the swap experience. Um, you know how to get Swapper Cloud and like you know what, just what that means to the uh, the protocol in general, and then what what the plan is for uh, just scaling up Swapper Cloud. Yeah, I, I would love to talk about just. I mean, Chad was the one that wrote the code for it, but it's. Probably the feature that I'm most excited about, um, other than streaming swaps, um, because again, it's one of those things that um, you know just enhances the core product offering of Thorchain, which is of course cross-chain swaps. Um, so anybody who's swapped through Thorchain, you know, in the last couple months, has probably experienced a pretty long delay between when their swap actually completes and when they receive their funds. Um, and that's due to the scheduled outbound queue, which is basically a defensive measure that was introduced as a result of a number of um, security enhancements that were made over the last few years. But basically, the idea behind this, the outbound, or sorry, the scheduled queue, um, is that if anyone were ever to try to attack Thorchain in any way, um, we would basically have up to uh, one hour to detect those and allow the community to flag it. And, um, and basically pause trading uh, during that time while an investigation takes place. So th the only reason why like um, swapping isn't super fast on their chain already today is because of the de decentralized nature of the protocol. And in wanting to constantly improve the user experience of swappers, um, we're constantly looking at ways to balance the trade-off between that user experience and security of the network. And because we are a decentralized network and because we can't just, you know, pause things instantaneously or um, roll out patches quickly, we want to take an overly defensive network uh, posture um, to security that, you know, um, for better or for worse, centralized exchanges don't really have that, uh, that limitation. So um, basically, Swapper Cloud was built as a feature to counteract the negative effects of a different feature it just so happens that those two features have opposite but both equally relevant um, standing for the, the protocol, which is, again, um, you know, balancing the, the user experience with, with the security of the network. So what Swapper Cloud does is it, it basically keeps track of all of the liquidity fees paid um, by each from and to asset addresses for every, for every asset that's ever taken place on ThorChain. Um, so this even includes uh, 
transactions that happened in the past. We backfilled all of the you know liquidity fees and applied those uh, retroactively to every address um, that's ever transacted on Thorchain. So if you've already paid you know a million, two million dollars worth of liquidity fees, it's likely that you're you know you're you're a legitimate user. Um, it increases the bar for what an attacker would have to do. They would basically have to like swap tens of millions of dollars through the network um, in order to you know get this discount. But and, and 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 so this discount doesn't apply to the majority of swappers. But importantly, what it does do is it excludes the volume from those transactions from the security feature. And because half of the um, half of the volume that takes place on Thorchain is arbitrage volume. Formerly, arbitrage volume and just like organic swapper volume, like say, you know, Joe Swapper from Trust Wallet, their um, volumes would both count equally towards um, engaging that security measure, the scheduled outbound delay. And so basically what this does is this kind of looks at it and says, okay, this op, this our bot has been swapping back and forth on the network and they've generated millions of dollars of liquidity fees and so they're receiving tons of utility from the protocol. Um, and so basically we're not going to count their volume towards uh, that, that, that scheduled outbound queue. So in that sense, like both the ARB is getting a better, you know, they're, they're basically getting better execution because they're not waiting as long, but also everyday swappers who are just swapping through wallets are getting better um, or faster execution because the total amount of um, uh, volume that's being looked at is lower due to the ARB volume being excluded from the security feature. Um, so it's really it really kind of like a novel concept. Like most people don't need to know about this at all, um, but it's just something that everyday swappers are going to get much faster. Um, it, you know, it's not actually execution time. You know, the, the 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 swaps actually execute quite quickly, even on an unbounded streaming swap. You know, the most I've seen, you know, certain um, swaps go for, like, under millions of dollars is around 30 blocks or so, which is, um, like, three, four minutes. So the swap itself actually executes after three or four minutes, but it sits in this queue waiting to be flagged if it is a suspicious transaction by anyone in the community. Um, and if, you know, if, if, but if not, there's no reason that it needs to be sitting there that long. And so what this um, feature does is it basically allows us to, you know, get things moving faster. Um, and, the, and the last point I'll make on that is that, you know, there, there's there's ways that we, we can, you know, we, we could just get rid of the scheduled outbound delay today, um, but that wouldn't be like a very prudent security posture. That said, as the protocol continues to ossify, and you'll hear me talk about a lot about this because it's, I think, like where we should eventually try to get to where... We're not releasing new features. We're just, you know, letting things run because that allows us to actually scale back these security measures to allow things to move through the network more quickly and process more volume. So basically, you know, this entire journey has been a, uh, a balancing act between security and user experience. And we're just now starting to feel comfortable enough and, you know, shipping, um, um, features like Swapper Cloud to be able to start to pare back some of those things to provide a better UX. So right now it's rolled out uh, and to a smaller value than the, than the final value is. So I believe we've rolled it out to a Swapper Cloud maximum value of 50K rune, which means it would apply up to uh, a swap of with the value being 50,000 uh, 50, rune, or how, how exactly do, do these caps work in relation to like the rollout of Swapper Cloud and scaling it up to um, what the bug bounty is? Yeah, so the uh, on any particular outbound, you can you have like a, a clout number. Say, say your clout number is 200k rune, just for the sake of discussion. Any one particular outbound could only use 50k of that 200k. So you can, you can use the full 200k you know, in a short period of time, if you had, you know, um, four transactions, up four up on transactions, but you couldn't use it all in one transaction. And so um, the original intention, at least how I was thinking about it, was just to have the outbound, this kind of cap be, be the same as the, the, bug out, the bug bounty 
which makes logical sense. But I think like once we, we we've launched, now we we launched the proper cloud concept, we can, we can now look on chain to see like are we even using the fifty k? Are we even like does it make even? Does it, are we actually getting anything by increasing it to, to two hundred or two hundred and fifty or whatever it is? And so I think what I'm just doing is, and I think Orion, who's also in the audience here. Uh, will help me with is that you know maybe in about a week's time or two weeks time we'll do an analysis and we'll and we'll do two things one is to figure out how often how frequently are we hitting that 50k cap and and out of you know as percentage wise and then the second thing we want to just ana analyze is um how much how much effect is Thrupper Cloud having on the upbound queue how much is it reducing on average, or either as an average or as a median, how is it reducing the um, time delay of the delayed outbound? And so we can compare, like you know, last week to this week, and you know, see the differences, like see how much of, a, of an improvement on the average time that, that swaps are waiting to be to be sent out. So I think we're just, at this point, we're just I'm just going to wait like a week or two and just kind of let the network collect some data, and then I'll probably work with Orion to um, do some analysis around it. Yeah, but so far, just based on the, the swaps that we've looked at, the majority of the ones that are getting stuck for, you know, up to an hour in the scheduled outbound queue are ones that would not have benefited from any higher of a, of a clout limit. So me meaning those are just like new wallets making large swaps through, um, you know, they, they basically haven't transacted before, so they're not even eligible for, for the swap or clout. So... Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, we'll just have to collect some data and see whether it even needs to be raised higher than it is. Correct. It may, it may not need it, but it'll, it'll, we'll make that decision based upon what the data tells us. I have two quick questions around the uh, swapper plant. Um, just so you can get some perspective, if I'm doing a $1,000 swap, uh, $1,000 room, say, of value uh, in a swap, how much cloud am I gain, getting? Is it just depending on the volume that I send through, or is it strictly depending on? Chad, I think I, I think a, a good a good way to answer the question would be: How much do you need to have swapped through Thorchain for your um, for your transaction to bypass the the security measure? Um, for a $1,000 swap. Maybe that's a good way to, to, to phrase it. Um, well, the, the, the swap or clout number increases with the amount of fees you're paying in the trade or swap. So if you're doing a thousand, thousand swap and you're p paying five, you know, five bips, it's, it's that five bips that you, that's increasing your number. So in order to get to that point where you're doing a thousand, whatever, you'd have to make that trade, um, what is it, 50 times? Or something? Was it? Is it? Uh, Fifty times. Is it? It's uh, um, four uh, four hundred times. That the number is something like this. About four hundred times. Something like that. So, so basically, if you transacted four hundred thousand dollars through Thorchain from an address that we've seen before, we don't throttle your outbound. Is that is that fair? Yes, that's fair, and, but it also matters of like what the fees you pay because if you do a streaming swap, obviously you'll pay less in fees, and by doing so, you get less of a swap, you get less less cloud for that. But if you did a, a non-streaming swap, you did like a regular swap, you obviously you'll pay more in fees. In which case, your swap of cloud is greater. So you can do it instead of doing four hundred times, you can do it maybe two hundred times if you just you know paid more in fees. Yeah, I get that. Uh, just I'll be right back. Here. Continue on. Also brought up uh, Alfonso here. Are you there? Hello, yes. How are you, hey. my friends? Two questions. The first one is when Thor USD will be available for everyone? And the second one is what is the possibility to, to put Luna and UST again in the protocol? Thank you. Uh, so, for the first question, um, my intention is to, it's not called Thor USD, it's called Tor, by the way, T-O-R. But my, my intent, my personal intention, this is my personal opinion, is to let Tor kind of operate for 6 to 12 months, which has already been about 6 months so far. Uh, but let it operate for 6 to 12 months, 
let it kind of show the, how effective the peg is so we can kind of as much as we can prove to the to the community of its of its uh, viability and then you know we'll just we'll do an, an ADR vote on it right and, and the community will vote it down or vote it up whichever direction it chooses to vote it. yeah before before we even get to that point I would like to see like more chains more reliable chains with more USD based assets on Thorchain before we even consider that. Um, and also we, we should make some tweaks. Like for example, we should uh, pause um, minting or redeeming of Torb when there's any less than two or three pools in the, in the Tor peg and the, sorry, in the Tor anchor pool. Um, I think one thing we noticed um, recently when there was a number of chain halts, like we had both Ethereum and AVAX halted. And so the only uh, USD anchor asset that was available was like a single pool. And people were still able to, to mint and redeem um, Tor using just a single pool to provide that, uh, that peg. So I think obviously that's undesirable. I, I would like to see like at least six stable coins across like four ch different unique chains with like proven reliability before we release Tor. I think Tor is one of those things that can greatly um, um, benefit the network, but it should only be launched once we're certain that we can keep um, keep that like keep keep all the chains uh, live, you know, constantly. And it's good that we recently went through uh, a lot of these growing pains which were the result of, you know, record transaction throughput on, on chains like AVAX and, and BSC, um, because those kind of forced us to, you know, meet those scaling challenges. So right now we're once again in like a, a hardening phase where the work we're doing now around stability will actually impact our, our ability to ship features like Tor in the future. I think I agree with Pluto in the sense of, um, adding more chains would be good. The more uh, anchors we have to Tor, the the stronger the, the 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 stronger the peg is, the stronger the token is, and the more reliable it is. Uh, I'm not sure I'd agree with the thing of like having a minimum of two or three. It's actually, um, at least in my view, it's it's perfectly fine to have it down to one. We we had the BUSD the other day because AVAX and, and ETH were were both paused. Whenever you trade pausing a uh, trade a uh, trade pause trading. Um, those get dropped from the from the kind of calculation for obvious reasons. Um, but also, what happens is the the depth of the Tor pool also goes down. So usually, it's around six million in depth, and during that time, it was down closer to two, which means that the fees are going to be higher. Right? It's harder to price manipulate because the fees are going to be much higher, um, and and the calculation of the depth of, the, of even the, the sub-calculation of that depth that's starting at two, and it can be, you know, one and a half or one or less than one, one million, based upon the volume relative to the depth of the pool. So it should be fine and safe even to, to do, you know, a single asset. Obviously, you don't want to sustain that for a long period of time for, for obvious reasons, because you don't um, want that one thing, to, that one token to, deep, like, BUSD to suddenly depeg for its, its own, on its own. And then cause an issue, but even if that did happen, you would just have the community come together and, and use operational mirrors to, you know, just pause that particular anchor as well until it's recovered. So I don't think I think it's fine to to have one or two assets in general, but not uh, not for like a long term. It's healthier for the protocol to have to have, to have more uh, more anchors. Oh, and the other question, the second question too. The second question about when do we get Luna UST back on on Thorchain? Um, I mean, I, I don't. There's not much talk about that, and I don't. Doesn't, doesn't seem to be there. Might be much demand or interest to add it back. To be honest with you, um, so I'm open to any chain, more or less. But there has to be a demand for it. I certainly wouldn't put that in front of like Solana or something like this, but. I don't know. I'm, I'm open to pretty much any chain as long as it's going to contribute value to the protocol. Cool. Let's keep it moving because I got to cop here pretty soon. But um, if if uh, if I would just say one thing before we, we continue on any further, um, 
you know, there was there's obviously probably a lot of you joining here today because you've seen a lot of stuff on Twitter, etc. Um, just want to catch everyone up who's just joining, uh, basically on the current state of things right now in the Thorchain community. Um, is basically to say that the devs the devs agree that um, all of the proposals to Thorfi and Savers and POL and, and Thorchain economics in general are still all in early draft. Um, so, you know, there's going to be plenty of other discussion that happens before those are taken to a vote um, for the node operators. Um, savings and lending are, you know, here to stay for the time being. And we acknowledge that there's a community sent sentiment towards gradually scaling those features and managing the risk of Thorify. And our top priorities um, in terms of, like, new things are... Does anything that really can result in more stability or a better swapping experience? So we just recently sp uh, spoke about Swapper Clout. We have memoless transactions coming down the pipe and order books as well. Um, so those things are obviously taking precedent right now because those are the things that benefit the core um, functionality of the project, which is, of course, cross-chain swaps. But as always, performance and stability remain as the top priority. Um, so just felt the need to, you know, clarify that um, since there's been a lot of question as to, you know, what the future of Thorchain is, and the answer is always it will continue to evolve as devs and the community engage in passioned and heated debate. But in the immediate thing, we remain laser focused on all of the things I just mentioned. Let me ask you a question, Plurix. I'm curious your, to hear your perspective. What are your, what's your feelings on the idea of perpetuals? Not that I'm saying we're going to do this or whatever, but I'm just curious to your, your high level viewpoint on it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's hard to deny like what it does for the economics um, of the project. And, you know, we we're all seeing the headlines right now about DYDX, you know, surpassing volume of Uniswap. But I think those comparisons are kind of silly because perpetuals don't create spot volume, which is what everyone else is measuring. And what you know creates the most fees? They're 